session 140. We're still in the book of Exodus. And today we continue with Exodus 30, and the anointing oil and the incense. From verse 22, And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Take for yourself choice spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much, 250, of sweet-smelling cinnamon, and 250 of sweet-smelling cane, and 500 of cassia, according to the shekel of the set-apart place, and a hin of olive oil. So this is a different recipe. We, in a couple of uh, sessions ago, we looked at the um, holy, not-to-be-repeated recipe for the incense. Now this is the recipe for the anointing oil. This is something different. And you shall make from these set-apart spices, anointing oil, a compound blended, the work of a perfumer. It is a set-apart anointing oil, oil that is used for anointing. And what do you do with this oil? With it you shall anoint the tent of appointment and the ark of the witness, and the table and all its utensils, and the lampstand, the menorah, and all its utensils, and the slaughter place of incense, and the slaughter place of the ascending offering with all its utensils, and the, bra the bronze basin that we discussed yesterday, and the stand of the bronze basin. And you shall set all these things that you are anointing, they shall be set apart, and they shall be most set apart. Whatever touches them is also to be set apart. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons, and you shall set them apart to serve as priests to me. And speak to the children of Israel, saying, This is a set apart anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the flesh of any man, and make no other like it. Don't use the composition or the recipe to make something for yourself. It is set apart for me alone. Whoever compounds anything like this, or whoever uses this and puts it on something else besides what I am commanding, shall be cut off from the people. So the sacred recipes, it shall not be poured on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like of it in the same proportions, because it is holy. The Torah provides two last preparations for the tabernacle by giving us the recipes for making the holy incense and the anointing oil. We've discussed the holy incense before. Today we're discussing the anointing oil. Both recipes are accompanied with a very stern and serious warning against misusing the sacred recipes for personal applications. The tabernacle incense was to be used only by the priests in the sacred service. And the anointing oil was to be used only for anointing the priest and all the tabernacle implements. Laws like these, there's many laws where Yahuwah gives us stern warnings not to use his utensils or his incense or his oil or his recipe or any of his set-apart things for common use. Laws like these teach us about the importance of separating between the holy and the mundane between service to Yahuwah and normal camp life, between holy and normal, there is a distinction. Today's religious world seems to have lost the ability to distinguish between sacred and the secular. Materialism and consumerism further obscure the lines as marketing attempts to package and sell religion. And here we learn in these Torah commandments that God's religion is it's expensive. It cost him not only leaving the throne in heaven and actually tabernacling with his people in the wilderness. But that was only a shadow picture of how in the future he would leave his throne in heaven and not only tabernacle with us on earth but also giving his life. To set apart, to distinguish, and to, to, to understand the difference between the holy and the normal is very important. And that's why we learned so much about not mixing the incense or not changing the recipe. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And His recipe 
for everything, for how we worship Him, how we obey Him, how we walk behind Him through the wilderness, on the way to the promised land, how we love Him, how we serve Him, how we are His servants and His friends and His uh, sons and daughters and His bride. That recipe that has been given from the beginning has never changed. And to mix it with traditions of men or pagan traditions or even to just mix it with normal stuff that we think should be all right. I mean, it still is nice. God knows my heart. I have good intentions. But we are not allowed to mix the holy with the unholy. We're not allowed to mix kosher with non-kosher. We're not allowed to mix in the spirit what is not commanded by him and to think we can serve him with that and he must be you know happy with it he must appreciate it we love him even though we mix doctrines or religions or practices or traditions it doesn't work like that psalm 133 verse 1 and 2 a song of degrees by david behold how good and how pleasant it is for brother brethren brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that runs down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down all the way to the skirts of his garments. To live in one goal, unmixed religion, unadulterated doctrine, the pure doctrine that falls from heaven like raindrops to live like that in unity with brothers and sisters inside the camp God sees that as the precious ointment and it's poured out over your head it runs down your beard it runs down all your garments all the way to the skirts of your garments and this is the unadulterated recipe, the holy recipe of, of worshipping God according to his instructions. Anointing from the root word that means to be added, to add to something, to exalt something. The word anointing suggests that the anointing exalts that which is being anointed. Whether it was the holy objects or the utensils or the Ark of the Covenant or any of the um, items that was used at the slaughter place or whether it was the humans, Aaron and his sons, all that is holy or set apart for service or worship or ministering in the presence of Yahuwah is being anointed. And that's also showing forward towards the Holy um, Spirit of Yahuwah the Ruach HaKodesh, which anoints the people inside the camp, the people that comes to the tabernacle to worship and serve God and love Him inside the borders, I almost want to say, inside the parameters that He sets. We can't, like um, uh, the golden calf, come and mix religion and come and mix worship and say we do it as for Yahuwah, but we do it with pagan traditions we we come in this clear set out goal that we have to do everything according to the will of God and that will bring us into the situation where we can also be anointed with the holy set apart oil all right let's um, continue with uh, the next thing the um, Yahuwah's chosen place of worship Deuteronomy 12 these are the laws and the right rulings which you guard to do in the land which Yahuwah your Elohim of your fathers is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the soil. Yes, I know. This was given to the twelve tribes and to the camp of Israel. They would inherit Jerusalem. But as you know by now, studying for more than two years already, we have been chucked out of the land because of our disobedience, because we didn't separate between God and the pagans. Because we didn't separate between holy and normal or something that doesn't fit in, in God's structure. And that's why he warned us we will be exiled from the land and we will be scattered all over the world. But the promise that God made does not change. Just like his recipes 
for his worship doesn't change. He's the same. And all the way up to where we are today in 2021, it's more than 5,000 years since he made the promise that Israel, Jerusalem, will be the place that he chooses for his people to meet with him and where he chooses for his throne to be established and where he chooses for his kingdom to rule and reign the rest of this world from Jerusalem. And in the physical, this happened with David. But in the spiritual, this promise is still applicable. And although we are not in Jerusalem, we all desire to go back to be resurrected at that last and final trumpet call and to be taken by the Messiah. And when his feet touches the Mount of Zion, the Mount of Olives, then we are with him and we will be in the new Jerusalem. And when after the thousand years that he rules and reigns from Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem from heaven will come down um, and, and, and God himself, Yahuwah, the Father, will establish his kingdom forever on this earth. But like I said to you before, not in London or Johannesburg, or no, in Jerusalem. Because from the beginning, from that very first moment that Abraham even had to walk all the way to that mountain to sacrifice his son Isaac. From that moment where David had the dream with the ladder that touched Hamakum, the place, this place where the temple would be built, which is the very same place where the Garden of Eden was, where the tree of life was. Because in Revelation 22, we, we see that we are entering through the gates of Jerusalem. Jer um, uh, Revelation 22 verse 14, only those who keep the commandments of God will have the right to enter through the gates of Jerusalem, not Joburg or London, nowhere else, and, and, and have access to the tree of life. So when we enter the gates of Jerusalem, what will be inside the tree of life? Just like God's holy place, God's place where he walked with his people, have been the Garden of Eden, the tree of life, the very same place. That specific beautiful place that has never changed over all these millenniums. So when we look at the at the laws that God gives for Jerusalem and how we love Jerusalem. Not the Talmudic um, Kabbalah Jews that call themselves Jews but are not. They are actually from the synagogue of Satan who rules the city Jerusalem, the physical land Jerusalem and Israel now. Not looking at that, but looking at that place will be cleansed. The whore of Babylon will be thrown into the fire. And Yahuwah's bride will be made pure and clean, and he will return to her. He will not forget her, he will not forsake her, and he will cleanse her again. And after he divorced her, he will marry her again. All that happens in Jerusalem. Yeshua stands on the mountain, and he starts crying. And he looks over Jerusalem, and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How many times I wanted to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you would not. You just continue to kill my prophets. This is God's desire for his bride to return home. And he is the one that will take us home at the end of the day. So in the meantime, we, we know that we as the um, stones, the living stones of the temple, we are still scattered. We are not in unity yet, where it's good and beautiful for brothers to live in unity. And it's like the anointing oil of God himself that pours over us and into our beards and all over our garments. We are not there yet. We are still scattered. But we are looking forward to be established again as the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. So we look at the laws and the right rulings and we know that we, we follow God in the way that he prescribes. And, and also in, in understanding the kingdom as established, the Jerusalem kingdom, the Israel kingdom, the kingdom of God. Yeshua says, I came only for, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. John the Baptist says, repent for the kingdom of God has come near. It's all about God um, restoring his house that he established with Abram, Isaac and Jacob. So we, we don't, when we study these commandments, we don't look at physical Jerusalem today. We look at the spiritual Jerusalem, how we are being gathered and being prepared. 
and how we are learning so that we, although scattered, we form the stones, the living stones of, the, of this kingdom of God. And one day we will be brought back together and we will form one nice, um, nation again under one Messiah, under one king. So these are the laws and the right rulings that we have to guard when we go into the land. Completely destroy all the places where the nations which you are dispossessing serve their gods on all the high mountains and all the high hills and in under every green tree. Christmas tree, oh Christmas, anyway. And you shall break down their slaughter places and smash their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. Ashtoreth, Ishtar, Easter. And you shall cut down the carved images of their mighty ones and shall destroy their names. All these Greek, false, Roman, Catholic names out of that place. So the names of all these Gentile deities, all these mighty ones, all these false god, while we are um, building Jerusalem in our own lives so that we one day can be part of God's Jerusalem, we have to burn down all the Ashtoreth. We have to smash the pillars and all these um, structures that we see on the rooftops of all the churches. That is promoting another kingdom and another sun god system that's not part of what we can do because when we come into jerusalem we must leave all that behind and all the names of the gentile deities of the all these pagan gods must, must come out of our lips we don't use that anymore that is what it means to be jerusalem and god says this you don't do to yahuwah you don't serve him with the pagan altars or pillars or um, carved images or names but you seek the place that Yahuwah your Elohim chooses out of all your tribes he chooses Jerusalem to put his name there for his dwelling place is Jerusalem and there you shall enter and there you shall take your ascending offerings your slaughters your tithing your contributions your vowed offerings your voluntary offerings the first born of your herd and of your flock and there you shall eat before Yahuwah and shall rejoice in all that you put your hand to you and all your household in which Yahuwah has blessed you do not do as we are doing here today Moses is speaking to Israel in Deuteronomy Moses is also speaking to us today do not do this anymore each one doing whatever you think is right in your own eyes or right in society's eyes, or right in your government, or right in your church, or your leaders. Don't do what is right in your own eyes. I'm telling you, this is the way that I want to be worshipped. Because he continues in verse 9, You have not entered the rest, the shalom, the shabbat. You haven't entered the rest and the inheritance which Yahuwah is giving you yet. But you shall pass over the Jordan River. And you shall dwell in the land that Yahuwah is giving you to inherit. And he shall give you rest, Shabbat, from all your enemies around. And you shall dwell in safety. So just looking at Jerusalem and Israel right now, they do not have rest from their enemies. Now the Third World War is on the brink. Just look at the news. Look at what Hezbollah and um, um, all these uh, Palest Palestinian... Um, enemies are currently doing sending rockets into Israel they don't have rest from the enemies so obviously this that Yahuwah is telling Israel in Deuteronomy 12 it, it hasn't happened yet people can't say that the promises for Abram Isaac and Jacob has been fulfilled in 1948 when the Jewish tribes went back to Israel bulldust they don't have uh, rest from their enemies they are not dwelling in safety this will only happen when Messiah, after he has cleansed this earth by his judgment, will establish Jerusalem again. And you shall rejoice before you, <coughs> Yahuwah your Elohim, you and your sons and your daughters, and your male servants and your female servants, and even the Levite who is within your gate. Guard yourself that you do not offer your offering in any other place. That is right in your own eyes. No, you only offer your offerings 
in the place that Yahuwah chooses. There you will offer your offerings. In all that I command you, you do. It's amazing. It's beautiful. God says that this is his household. This is his dwelling place in Deuteronomy 12. And he confirms it in Revelation 20 from verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Choch and Machoch, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they encompassed the camp. You see the camp of Israel, even in the book of Revelation. It hasn't changed. And they will encircle the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from Yahuwah out of heaven and devoured them. This is the second death. The beloved city is Jerusalem. Psalm 125 verse 2. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so is Yahuwah round about his people from here on forever and ever. Jerusalem is the only city that God has chosen out of all this earth where he met with his people, where the tabernacle became the temple and where Yeshua went to. He didn't go to London or Joburg. He came to Jerusalem and he's coming back to Jerusalem. And that's where he will rule and reign. And in the meantime, his bride, Jerusalem, here on earth, is being protected by the cloud in the wilderness, by the wings of his talit and by his arms. And it's like walls and like mountains around Jerusalem that he is with his people while we are walking through the wilderness until we enter over the Jordan. Psalm 122 verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You shall prosper. Oh, sorry. They shall prosper that love you. What is that? That those that love the peace of Jerusalem shall prosper. And in the meantime, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What is the peace of Jerusalem? Do we pray for Jerusalem now to have peace? No. The Third World War has to happen. Jacob and Esau has to fight. The land has to be destroyed for the new Jerusalem to, to come down onto earth. And the false Jerusalem Jewish system and the false Roman Catholic Christian system and all the other false systems has to be cleansed so that the true gospel can be preached and the, so that the end can come and the, the Jewish Messiah born from the tribe of Judah within Jerusalem and who died in Jerusalem, he has to come back and has to, to establish his kingdom. But he's not establishing it just on the, um, on the walls or on the foundations of another kingdom. He has to first destroy that kingdom. So it shall come to pass in that day, God says through the prophet Zechariah in chapter 12 verse 9, it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And that's not only Hezbollah and Palestine and the Illuminati world leaders that, are, that all has, according to them, Jewish blood in them and the banking system and the new world order. It, it's not only about them, but it's, it's this whole Babylonian Egyptian system that is crushing Jerusalem. Although we are crushed, we are not beaten. And we will stand up and we will be regathered as the, the lost stones of the temple will be gathered in the hands of the Messiah and he will build his temple again. But there will come a time that Jerusalem will be destroyed, the physical city. And the people is scattered. Jerusalem has been destroyed many times in ancient history. And the people got scattered. And now the people that is scattered is Jerusalem. And God will, will bring his city back together. And he will establish it on the foundations of his Torah. For those who follow him. And who obey him. And who is loyal to him throughout the wilderness journey. 
Jeremiah 3 verse 17, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of God, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it. Where? To the throne of God. And where is the throne of God? In Jerusalem. What is that time that Jeremiah is prophesying about? The last days. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of God, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of Yahuwah, to Jerusalem, not to Joburg or London, to Jerusalem. Listen to this, Jeremiah 3.17. Highlight this in your Bible. All the nations shall be gathered unto Jerusalem, to the throne of God, to the name of Yahuwah, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imaginations of their evil hearts. Just like God said in Deuteronomy 12, you will no longer do what is right in your own eyes. You will follow the Messiah into the promised land and you will obey him. Isaiah 62 verse 1 For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. So the salvation, the Yeshua, as a lamp that burns, as the menorah that burns in the tabernacle. I will not hold my peace, says God, for Zion's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until I have established Jerusalem and Zion again in righteousness, and they will be on the mountain as a lamp that burns. And Yeshua says, whoever has a lamp will not put it under a bucket, but you put it in the windowsill or on top of the table so everyone can see the brightness thereof. The peace of Jerusalem, the salvation of Jerusalem, is Yeshua the Messiah. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful to understand this city that Yahuwah has chosen. His beloved city, his original home here on earth, that has been devastated and has been <clears throat> made unclean. But he will clean it again and this will be his dwelling place forever. All right, the oil of the lamp, Exodus 27, verse 20. And you, you are to command the children of Israel to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, so that you can cause the lamp, the menorah, to burn continually. In the tent of appointment, outside the veil, which is before the Ark of the Covenant, before the witness, Aaron and his sons are to tend to the menorah, from evening until morning before Yahuwah. This is a law forever to your generations from the children of Israel. So I'm reminding you again to really understand the oil for the menorah. Please work through the parable of the ten virgins. This is to be found if you go to the Two Trees website www.twotreesinthegarden.co.za and remember that's a number two. Then click on the YouTube link and when you're in the Two Trees YouTube page, look for the end times and the parable of the ten virgins. And study this to understand what it means to have oil in your lamp and how it shows back to the oil of the menorah. And this is what we are burning while we are walking in the wilderness. So that when the bridegroom finally comes, we will not be caught with too little oil. Because as Yahuwah said, he will not rest until Jerusalem shines as a lamp and until the righteousness of Jerusalem go forth as the brightness. And therefore we have to have this oil, this, this anointing oil that is made for the tabernacle service and for the menorah and for the light to shine. We have to understand this light and this oil and this kingdom. And therefore we have no excuse like the five foolish virgins, to stand at the end of the day before the door and knock and hear Messiah say, you know what, you didn't care enough to understand my kingdom. You did what was good in your own eyes and right in your own eyes, but I warned you not to do it. You walked after the imaginations of your own hearts. You walked after the traditions of your fathers. Go away from me, I never knew you. 
Proverbs 6 verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and your Torah, Yahuwah, is a light. Your reproofs of instructions is the way of life. This oil, this holy anointing oil, is used to anoint, to exalt, to make set apart everything that teaches us how to walk in the way of life, how to worship and serve Yahuwah. And this shows forth to the Torah, the way in which we live before our God. Because the Torah is a lamp, the Torah is a light. Psalm 6, uh, Proverbs 6 verse 23, Psalm 119 um, verse 105, Your word, your Torah, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And this is the, the way in which we walk. Yeshua is the only way. Following God, following the priest that carries the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders through the wilderness. This is the way to walk back into the promised land and live there forever with our God. There is no other way. We look at the table of showbread, Exodus 25 verse 30. And you shall put the bread, the showbread, on the table before me continually. This is the table of showbread in the holy place. John 6 verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, but they still died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, that if a man eat thereof, they will not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. We just read in Proverbs 6 verse 23, The commandment is a lamp, the law is light, and your instructions is the way of life. Yeshua says, I am the bread of life. The Bible says Yeshua is the word of God that became flesh, and we eat the word as we eat bread. And we understand that this is what sustains us. We don't live from physical bread alone. We don't live from the manna in the wilderness alone. But the bread that is continually before Yahuwah on his table, inside his tabernacle, is his Torah. This is on God's table. This is what God eats. It's, it's God's, what we sacrifice to Yahuwah, we put on his table. And what is good enough for him to be put on his table is good enough for us on our tables. And we eat this bread that is the Torah that is broken for us and given to us and had to die for us so that we can get forgive, forgiveness for not following these instructions of life, for not following the commandment that is a lamp, for not understanding the anointing oil. But now we do, and we come in repentance, and we are washed clean by the blood on the altar, and we wash with the water in the bronze basin, and we come into the holy place, and we see the bread of life on the showbread table, and we see the menorah and the oil and the light, and we see the altar of incense, and we smell the, the burning of the incense, and we, we see how everything is glistening with the anointing oil that was used to set everything apart. And we go through the torn flesh of Messiah that is the veil. And we bow bef be before the throne of God that is called in the prophets as, as it is in Jerusalem. We, 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 we bow before the God of Jerusalem and, and where he puts his name. And we come to the feet of God. And like the man out of whom Yeshua sent out the demons, he was naked and he was delusional, and he was living in the cemetery. We come out from that system, and we go through all these processes of being clothed, and having a sober mind, and coming to sitting at the feet, in front of the throne of our God. And he sits on the throne, the mercy seat, and the foundations of his throne is his beautiful Torah, his beautiful instructions that tells us how we must live if we are part of his kingdom. John 6 verse 26, Yeshua answered them and said, Verily I say unto you, you are looking for me. Why are you looking for me? It's not because you saw my miracles, but it's because you ate the bread that I gave you and you were filled. 
Yeshua wasn't really happy with his people that was always looking for him because he had this huge miracle where he um, increased the bread and the fish and other people were walking behind him and always looking for him and he says to them, I know why you're looking for me. You just want physical bread. That's all that you want. If that's all that you want, just rather go away from me because I'm not here to only give you bread for your stomach. I'm here to give you bread for your spirit, for your life, for your eternal life in the new kingdom that I will establish. He continues in John 6, 27. Labor not for the meat or the bread that perishes, but labor for the food that endures unto everlasting life. The bread that will endure Dear unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him, the Son of Man, Yeshua, God the Father hath anointed. So the anointed high priest, with the anointing oil of the tabernacle, that flows from his head down his beard onto his garments, he is anointed for this work to give us the bread of life. And the people that are walking behind him to get bread for their stomach is going to end up standing before the door and knocking. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Because all I was to you was just an ATM machine. And when things got tough and you were looking for bread to eat and there was none, you didn't have the sustenance of the bread of life that could endure you all the way through the wilderness. So that you can enter with me into the gates of the city and eat again from the tree of life. That's why we are studying these Torah commandments. Because it's much more important than we can really ever deeply understand. And that's why we, we try to understand the physical application of this. Because this is what, so, what will sustain us in the troubled times that is coming upon this world. If we don't fill ourselves, fill our stomachs and our souls with what Yeshua, the Torah, God, Yahuwah, the one who sits on the throne, is giving us, we will not be able to endure all the way to the end. Eat the bread and drink the living water, that if you eat and drink this, you shall never thirst or hunger again.